Guys, good morning. morning. Pray for Pastor Chad. He's on his way back from Arizona. Going to be back here tonight. But he went out there to spend a couple of days with his family. Isn't that good Good to do that from time to time? Uh, Pastor Chad asked me, he says, can you preach in this end of the world series on the rapture? Well, his sign says 212, the end of the world as you know it. I began to look at the rapture, the end of my theology as I knew it. You know, it, it, it was one of those interesting experiences I had studying because I've been in Bible college and seminary and I'm a seminary professor. I have studied the rapture. And I went to preach and I said, this is going to be easy. And I go to take out all my notes on the rapture. I'm going to pull it together. I'm going to wow you guys that I got it nailed. And the Lord says to me, put it aside. All you're going to do is you're going to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says. Oh, that's heavy. You mean God? You're going to mess with my theology? Yep. So let's have some fun this morning. You ready to have some fun? Uh, these are some pictures, by the way. That rock is called the Mayan calendar. It's set in stone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. Uh, the other things are Harold Camping from last year. It seems about every year at this time, how many of you notice that somebody is always seeming to predict the end of the world? Okay, including Christians. Well, here we go again. Uh, I'm going to put three of them up because we got the things mix, mixed up. Here we go again. Buckle your seatbelt. Look at the bottom. The world's going to end on December 21st. Or is it 12th? Yeah, 21st at 6 p.m. Good news, don't do any Christmas shopping. <laughs> don't do any Christmas shopping. You won't need to. Uh, well, that's what the scientists say that are studying the Mayan calendar. That's what they're saying. And uh, the interesting thing, is some of the scientists say they may be off as much as uh, 60 days. Um, I think they want to have one more Christmas. <laughs> well, let me talk to you about the Mayans. There's going to be lots of stuff in the news. Let me tell you what we know for sure. The Mayans are no more. Okay? They live between 250 and 900. Somebody was here that was wearing Mayan sandals. They weren't made by Mayans. They were made in China. Okay, the Mayans ain't around. They've been gone for over, over a thousand years. But they developed a calendar that they wrote on a rock. And what happened is the Mayans had 52 cycles in their calendar. Each cycle was a year, okay, in their parlance. And 52 was the maximum amount you were allowed to live. Well, at least that's the way they figured it out because they didn't have anyone in their nation, in their culture, who had ever lived for more than 52 years. But they needed a way to test history. So what they did is they developed a long and a short calendar. So the short calendar was to measure your life by. 
Everybody, every Mayan, had a 52-year calendar. And there was all sorts of symbolism and everything else for each year of your life. But they had a long calendar because what they needed to do, they needed to have a way of recording their history and a way of recording stuff that would happen in the future. So they developed this long calendar. And the start date that the Mayans set for their calendar was 3114 BC. Why 3114 BC? Anybody know? I don't either. Pick a date out of a hat, whatever. But that's the date. And then the calendar went for 5,126 years. And that's the, the, the calendar you're looking at, that big rock. And it goes round and round and round and round. Why 5,126 years? They ran out of rock. <laughs> well, that answer's as good as any. But what happened is then what happened is some scientists said that if you add 5,126 years to the start date of their calendar, the world's going to end on December 21st, 2012. Now you know what the Mayan calendar is all about. Now they got a couple of assumptions. One assumption they're making that the Mayans never made is the end of the calendar is the end of the world. The Mayans never said that. The Mayans just ran out of rock when they were making their calendar. Some scientists said, oh, they must have been right. Well, the same scientists that said the Mayans are right on the end of the world believe that the start of the world was millions of years ago, not 3,114. Talk about being inconsistent. Okay? So some of this stuff is a lot of, can I say, yeah, malarkey is the good word. That's the word you can use in church. <laughs> but uh, last year, the world was predicted to end. How many of you remember that? May 21st, 2000. Uh, this, the Christ would return, rapture his people, the tribulation would start immediately. The guy that started that was a guy by the name of Harold Camping. He's the host of the Family Radio Network up in the valley up here. And by the way, I want you to see this. This sort of stuff doesn't come from people who are flakes. This is an ordained minister in the Christian Reformed Church. Okay? He's not way out there. He's, he still believes, believe it or not, that people need to be saved the way we talk about people being saved. Believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. He still believes in all of that. He just whacked out when it comes to this stuff. Okay? He also previously predicted, just for your information, the world to end in September 1994. But in fairness, uh, when he did that, when he said, oh, I might be a few years off. Uh, Hal Lindsey. I like Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey was one of my professors. Hal Lindsey wrote a book called The Great Late Planet Earth. Hal's not a flake. He still believes that people need to come to know Jesus Christ to be saved. He's not a flake, but he wrote a book called The Great Late Planet Earth. Okay? And in that book, he makes this assertion, the fig tree of the book of Matthew coming into blossom is the nation of Israel that became a nation once again in 1948. And he uses the text, and this generation will not pass away until all be fulfilled. And he says a generation is 40 years, so Christ would come back and the tribulation would start sometime before 1988. Now he sold 35 million books, the great late planet Earth, made over $4 million in royalties. Let me ask you a question, because I want you to just see how stupid some of this stuff gets. I'm not, Al Lindsay's an evangelical, I'm not putting him down for that. But if I had $5 million dollars, and I knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, would I invest it in spreading the gospel or in real estate? Why did Hal Lindsey invest it in real estate? If he really believed it. But his latest prediction is that just as John the Baptist was the precursor to the coming of Christ, President Obama is the precursor to the Antichrist. That's the latest that's out there. 
But as he says, prophecy is big business. And, and by the way, I put these up, and I'm making fun of these guys, and I'm going to be an equal opportunity insulter. <laughs> because this stuff gets crazier the longer you look at it. This joins a list. The Catholics get in. Any Catholics here? Or people who were Catholics? Great. So much for the infallibility of the Pope. Pope Innocent predicted the end of the world in 1284. Oops. How about 16th century, Mother Shipton? She was a poet. The world to an end shall come in 1881. Pastor Chad last week talked about 88 reasons why Christ would come back in 1988. How about uh, the 17th century Baptists? Well, we get into it. Baptist preacher Benjamin Keach predicted the world would end in 1689. Jehovah's Witnesses have predicted the end of numerous times, 19, 9, 14, 15, 18, 20, 25, 41, 75, 94. At what point do you stone the prophet because he's wrong? <laughs> this is fun. William Miller, another good Baptist, he was one of the pioneers of the millennial movement. And William Miller predicted that the world, uh, predicted the time of Christ's second coming, and he plotted it all out, and he had a few schemes that he worked out in terms of the numerology, and he said, it's going to happen on, 18, on October 22nd, 1844, it's the big day. So he told all the Christians, sell everything you have, and come and sit on the mountain. And they did. They went and they sat on the mountain. It became known as the Great Disappointment. <laughs> they, but out of that survived the Adventist church, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and others who believe that they've got a handle on the calendar. Okay? Now everybody wants to know answers to three questions. Okay? Is the world going to end? And if so, when's it going to end? Anybody like to know the answer to that? If it's going to end? Okay. Some of you don't care. That's okay. Now, Christians particularly know, when is Christ coming back? How many of you would like to know that? When is Christ coming back? Okay. Number three, can the end of the world or the rapture be predicted? Well, let's have some fun. When is he coming back? I'm going to read you some of the verses that Chad read last week and then add some others to it. And then let's try and unpack this. And I'm going to mess with your theology because God messed with mine, okay? So just keep your mind open and we'll look at something. Later Jesus sat on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and asked this question. When will all this take place and will there be any sign ahead of time to signal your return and the end of the world? That's the question. Now what we've got to do is look at Christ's answer and try and figure out did he answer the question? Well, it says, For many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Messiah. They will lead away many astray. Wars will break out near and far, but don't panic. Yes, these things must come, but what does it say? But the end will not follow immediately. Uh, Mark says, that's not the sign. The nations and kingdoms will proclaim war against each other and there will be famines and, and earthquakes in many parts of the world. And all this will only be the beginning of horrors to come. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because of your allegiance to me. And many will turn away and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and lead many people astray. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold, but those who endure to the end will be saved. Here's the answer to the question. He says, all this stuff's going to happen. But here's the answer to the question. You say, what's the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? He says, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then, finally, the end will come. He does answer the question. But he doesn't answer the question by giving you a schematic to figure out when he's coming back. He answers the question by giving you a task to do until he comes back. That's profound. Write it down. <laughs> Acts 1. I want you to see how consistent Jesus is and how dumb the disciples are. 
Okay? The disciples come on Acts 1 when Jesus is just getting ready to ascend. Look what they ask. They said, asked of him, are you going to restore the kingdom? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons. It's not for you to know all of these signs that are going to occur, which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? My witnesses unto both Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. Well, what about the rapture? Pastor Chad asked me to talk about the rapture, so let's take a look at the rapture. The passage is 1 Thessalonians, and then we're going to put all of this together for you. And now, brothers and sisters, I want you to know what will happen to Christians who have died so you will not be full of sorrow like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus comes, God will bring back with Jesus all the Christians who have died. I can tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not, will not rise to meet him ahead of those who are in their graves. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the call of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. First, all the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with the Lord forever. So comfort one another with these words. So let's ask the question, what is the rapture? The rapture is a biblical concept, but it's not a biblical word. There isn't a biblical word in the Greek or in the English for rapture. Okay? So just to put that out. But that doesn't mean it's not a correct doctrine. The word Trinity is not in the Bible either. But we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So because the word rapture is there doesn't mean rapture isn't taught, but it's a biblical concept. And it refers, here's what the rapture refers to, and make sure you're precise on what it refers to. It refers to the call of God to the dead in Christ to rise and the removal of Christians from the world in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, prior to the second coming of Christ to earth, which is called the day of the Lord, which is very public and very visible. Okay, so that's what the rapture is. It is distinguished, it's often distinguished from the second coming because of the difference between that which is sudden and private versus that which is public and well publicized. But it signals the start of Christ direct rulership over the earth with his saints. So it is distinguished from that event. Now, I need to say something else. Many see the rapture, in fact, I would say more than half, half of all Christians, see the rapture as part of the second coming. They don't see it as a distinct event, and let me explain why. This is for those who are the deep theologians in the crowd. The rest of you can take a 30-second time out. The text says in Thessalonians, we rise to meet the Lord, where? In the air. Now, if the Lord and the rapture took us to heaven, why does Thessalonians say we're taken to the air? Here's what most theologians and most biblical scholars believe. Christ is coming back to set up his kingdom, and he calls his church to join him in the air to come back to reign with him on earth. And it's one simultaneous act. His coming, our coming up to meet him, and then returning. And the picture is of the bridegroom, and they get this from Matthew chapter 25, the story of the bride and the bridegroom. When the bridegroom is coming, the bride's parents go out to, or family goes out to meet the groom and comes back with him. They don't go to the groom's house. He's already on the way. And in that prophetic passage, the story of the bride and the bridegroom, that's where most Christians come out 
Uh, it's not the only place Christians come out because some people believe the rapture occurs, that's the start of the tribulation, and then seven years later, you have the second coming, and that's a possible position. But here's something that I want you to grasp, and this is very important. There is nothing in Scripture that teaches an imminent return of Christ, or an imminent return of Christ. <coughs> Let me explain what that means. How many of you have ever heard a preacher get up and say, you better get your life right with God today because Christ could come back before this service is over. Anybody ever heard that? Forget it, it's wrong. <laughs> you may die before this service is over and you better be right with God. That is correct. But to say he could come back before the end of the service is to disregard what Jesus said. Okay, preach is good. Yell it loud and people won't know you're telling them something that's wrong. But it's not taught in scripture. I've put had on my Facebook all week. I said, can anybody give me a scripture to prove the imminent return of Christ? Nobody can. It's a theology. It's part of pop cultural eschatology or pop cultural future things theology that's not in the Bible. The fact that Christ is coming back and we can be sure of that, is in the Bible. But, you know, I can tell you right now, I would go ahead and buy your Christmas presents. <laughs> and not worry about it. Now, let me draw a diagram for you. It'll probably help us. There's the present. There's a period called the Tribulation. There's a period called the Thousand-Year Reign or the Millennial Kingdom. Those of you who are part of it, just listen to me on this for just a moment because I want to help you make sense. Most missionaries who live in areas of unbelievable persecution where you just get killed for making a decision for Christ, who are living in places where people are dying every day of starvation, who are seeing trauma like you've never done, they believe we're actually living in the tribulation right now because they don't see the tribulation as a literal seven year period, they say it as, see it as a figurative period of time that is increasing in its intensity all the way to the second coming of Christ. Now, as I said, that's probably where most Christians around the world come out. Christians in America have followed uh, the fact that the Christians get, that it's a literal seven years and Christians go out before that. Then there's the eternal state. Now here's what we know from what Jesus said. In this period here, from the present until up to the tribulation for sure, maybe through the tribulation, the gospel is to be preached. Because remember what Jesus said. This gospel has to be preached to all nations and then the end comes. So the end could be defined as the beginning of the tribulation, or it could be defined as the end of the tribulation. It really doesn't matter. Okay? Oops. Took that off. Here are the rapture possibilities. The rapture possibilities are from the beginning of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation, or anywhere in between. Okay? Now, I'll tell you why. Here are the issues. The end of the age is tied to a very specific event. That is the gospel being preached to the end of the world, to the end of the age. That's what it's tied, tied to. If you believe that the church is the vehicle through which the gospel is to be preached, that means you hold a position where the church gets raptured at the end of the tribulation. Because we know from the scriptures that people get saved during the tribulation. How many of you, that shakes up your theology because you were hoping to escape all that stuff. Messed with me. The third thing, for the church to be removed before that occurs would be to disregard a specific statement of Christ. Now let me give you the out that if you want a pre-tribulational rapture that you, you take. There are the two witnesses that are talked about in the book of Revelation. 
And if you believe that the primary ingathering in the tribulation is Jewish and the 144,000 and all of that sort of stuff, then you can believe that the witness is started by the two witnesses, Elijah and Moses and Elijah, that are the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation. You believe that they are the seed that God plants during the tribulational period and the church is already removed. I can go with that. Don't have a problem with it. It's a possibility. But you still got to address the question. There are people from every tribe and nation reached before the end comes. Okay, you've got, to, you've got to go with what Jesus said. Now, what did Jesus say? The first thing he told us is there was always going to be prognosticators that are going to tell us about the end times. It's been going on. I showed you the historical data. I could have put up another 50. This is going on almost every year. You get somebody who's putting something out about the end time, and Jesus says, Forget about it. it. There's always going to be prognosticators. They're going to try and tell you the world's going to come to an end. Okay? Now Jesus says there are things that are going to happen, but the things that happen, he says it right in the text we read, are not in and of themselves the sign. They're not the sign. Because he says specifically, it's not for us to know the exact time of Christ's return. And keeping the main thing, the main thing is the main thing. Now, let me, I'm going to try and nail this down for you, and then we're going to uh, look at some scripture. The time was known, the time of Christ's return is known by one person and one person only, it is known by the Father. If Jesus says, I don't know, only the Father knows, either Jesus is a liar, or only the Father knows. And if Jesus doesn't know, don't think you're smart enough to figure it out. Okay? The Holy Spirit doesn't know. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit told you the end of the world is going to come at such and such a time. The Holy Spirit doesn't know. Jesus said, only the Father knows. Okay? And the return was tied to a time that the gospel was preached to the end of the world. Now, let me ask a question. This is where I will mess with you. Let's say you've got it right. I mean, you have uncovered the Da Vinci Code of Evangelicalism. You have got it figured out. You know that this sign and this sign and this sign is going to happen. The tribulation is going to start. There's going to be the abomination of death. And you get to heaven. God's going to come up to you right and pat you on the back and say, you're amazing. You figured it all out. And somebody else doesn't get it right. They were all millennial when they should have been premillennial. They were mid-trip when they should have been post-trip. Whatever it is. Is God going to say, I'm sorry, you got all this eschatology wrong. You're not admitted. Come on, guys. It's, that's stupid. I wish I could put it nicer. It's stupid. If Jesus was coming back today or tomorrow, what would you do differently today? What would you do differently today? If Jesus was coming back tomorrow, if you've got a kid that doesn't know the Lord, would you make sure you talk to them? If you've got an uncle or an aunt that didn't know the Lord, would you make sure you talk to them? If you have a person at work that you've got good friendship with and they didn't know the Lord, would you go and talk to them? If you knew Jesus was coming back today, would you be waiting or would you be working? That's the point. The disciples are asking what they ought to do to wait. Christ is telling them what they need to do to work. If Jesus was coming back in 10 years and you knew that for sure, what would you do differently today? The answer is it'd be absolutely nothing different than if he was coming back tomorrow. Come on, track with me. 
Does the task that Jesus left us to do change whether he's coming back tomorrow or 10 years from now? It's getting awful quiet in here. Are you, are you tracking with this? Now, we're going to look at it. Albert Moeller. Any of you listen to the Moeller radio broadcast? He's the president of the Southern Baptist Seminary. He's got a daily radio broadcast. He's one, considered one of the best theological minds in the country. Look what he says. The Bible does not contain hidden codes that are, that are hard to define and decipher. The Bible has been given to us in order that we might know the truth, and the truth is clearly revealed in its pages. We're not to look for hidden patterns of words, numbers, dates, or anything else. The Bible's message is plain and requires no mathematical computation for its understanding. The claim that one has found a hidden code or system in the Bible is an insult to the Bible as the Word of God. We're not to draw a line in history and set a date, but we are to be about the Father's business sharing the gospel and living faithful Christian lives. We're not to sit on rooftops like the Millerites waiting for Christ's return. We're to be busy doing what the Christ has commanded us to do. It's getting the emphasis on what's really important, folks. He's coming back. I can tell you that. I can shout it from the rooftops. But it doesn't change what's important for me right now. That's the point, because in eschatology, people are asking the question, I want to wait for his coming. I want to wait for his coming. The Millerites did it. Harold Camping did it. Hal Lindsey did it. Pope Innocent III did it. Been going on for a long time. People want to wait for his coming, but what does, what does Christ want us to do? Work for his coming. Work for his coming. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. You have in your hands the ability to control when Christ comes back. You have in your hands the ability to control when Christ comes back. You say, how do I know that? Well, let me give you a theology lesson. Any of you like going to school? I love, I love this stuff. The study of eschatology is the study of future things. Particularly as the MA, Pastor Chad talked about how much of the Bible is prophetic. I mean, there are over 300 prophecies just related to Christ alone. The Bible is full of prophecy, and eschatology is a study of prophecy, so it's important. And it looks at current events. That's what pro people who study prophecy, they try to look at current events and fit them in to the prophetic scheme. Now, they may be right and they may be wrong, but that's what they try to do. Soteriology is the study of the truths regarding salvation including the work of Christ, the nature, and the essence of the gospel. Now, the reason I want you to understand the difference is this. you got to ask the right question. The disciples ask an eschatological question. What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They're looking for this timeline. And Christ gives them a soteriological answer. This, by the way, is where politicians learned when you ask one question to them, they answer another one. Christ, they ask Christ a question about eschatology. He gives them an answer about soteriology. Preach the gospel. Now, while we look forward to Christ's return, our primary focus, listen, Never, never, never get your heart so cold you don't look forward to Christ coming back. But never let your heart be so cold that you're not concerned about the person next to you that doesn't know the Lord either. Does that make sense to you? Because that's what he's saying. While we look forward to Christ's return, our focus should be on the unreached people. Now let me help you understand that his coming is getting closer. Without putting a date on it, it is getting closer. Ethnos, the word that is translated nations here, is the word we get our word ethnic from. It's a multitude associated or living together. It's people who have the same kind of characteristics. In the Old Testament, which is a broader definition, it's everybody who wasn't a Jew. 
So it's, it's every kind of people group. Now, if you want a technical definition, I'm going to give you a technical definition. This is what you'd get if you were in my seminary class. When we look at a specific Greek word Jesus used in giving the Great Commission, we discover that his command was to disciple all peoples or ethnic groups, not countries, as most of us had assumed. Through the effort of thousands of missionaries over the years, there are now Christians in almost every country of the world. For that, you give God a great amen. Now, in terms of a people group, which is the word ethnos, it's a significantly large ethnic or sociological grouping of individuals who perceive themselves as having a common affinity for each other. For evangelistic purposes, listen to this. It's the largest group within which the gospel can spread without encountering barriers of understanding or acceptance. In other words, people have to be able to hear the gospel in a way that they can understand it. Okay? And it's the largest group that that can occur in. So here's the reality check. Missionaries, U.S. Center of World Missions over here in Pasadena, they define an unreached people group as having at least 100,000 people in it. Okay? Now, in 1980, any of you born, how many were born prior to 1980? Well, about half. Okay. In 1980, there were 20,000 groups, unreached people groups in the world that we could identify. 20,000. Today, it's 6,500 groups. We make in good progress, but it is not finished. There are at least 650 million people who haven't had the gospel translated into their language or culture. At least. Because remember, the group is a minimum of 100,000 people. But at least 650 million people that have yet to even have a witness to them. How do you reconcile that with the words of Jesus that he's not going to come back till every one of those people groups has been reached? Let me help you understand this. On the bottom is Greek. Okay? I don't expect you to read Greek. I don't even expect you to understand Greek. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something that's in the Greek text that you have to see to understand what Jesus is saying. Matthew 24, he gives this sign of the end of the time. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The word all nations is the Greek words panta, ta, ethne. And you see I've linked the two? Okay, now let's take a look at the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Greek... All nations is translated as what? Ponta, ta, ethne. So Jesus is being pretty precise and pretty specific, right? Let's take a look at Revelation. Revelation chapter 15. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. Ponta, ta, ethne. So you have the sign of his coming. The gospel is going to be preached, Pontita ethne. The command is given to, to preach the gospel, Pontita ethne. Why? Because in the eternal kingdom, there's going to be people there from Pontita ethne. Let me give you one other part of that. When Romans chapter 1 says that there is no people group that's ever going to be able to make an excuse that will stick, what is part of God's proof that the gospel would work for their people? There are people like them who've accepted Jesus. So they can't say the gospel wasn't for us. Or the gospel didn't fit our culture. And God has done that as part of his righteousness in judgment. So what? Let me wrap this up. Every one of us has someone the Lord is waiting and he wants us to reach. That's the personal application. Let me take a look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, 
And I'm going to have you look at this with me and look at it, what it says. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish, so he is giving more time for everyone to repent. Watch this. We tend to think that God isn't coming back because he's got a compassion for the world. For their sake, he's not coming back. Note what the text says. He says he's not coming back for your sake. Believe it or not, Robert, Jesus is not coming back yet for your sake. But you're already a believer. God's, Jesus is not coming back, Gary, for your sake. And you're a believer. James, Jesus is not coming back for your sake, and you're a believer. Why? Let me ask you a question. How many of you, just the three guys that I mentioned, how many of you have unsaved family or friends that you know that you don't want to go to heaven without? How many of you have got family or friends, grandkids? I don't know what the relationship are, but how many of you have got people in your life that you don't want to go to heaven without them? God knows that, folks. God knows that, and he's delayed his coming for that. Let that sink in. God loves the people that you know so much. He's stopping his son from coming back to take you home. Do you understand the love of God? Do you understand that? Do you understand how important the salvation of your kids, your grandkids, your neighbor, your work associate, do you understand how important that is to God? It's so important he's delaying the return of his son. Wow. I, look, I saw that this week. First time I really grabbed it. Changed my heart, folks. Changed my heart. Because if that's the reason, I better change what I'm doing. I better change what I'm doing. Because, as Peter goes on in the next verse to say, we can hasten his coming. We can get on with it and hasten his coming. Now, you've seen missionaries come here and we, take, we give money to missionaries, but if there are still 6,500 people groups that have never heard the name of Christ, we ought to have a mission mindset. You ought to be excited when the pastor asks you to give some extra money to reach, to reach some people that we can't reach. Because we want to hasten his coming. We want to reach people from every tribe and nation. And while I look forward to the day when Christ comes back, he didn't tell me to look at the clock. He told me to look at the fields that are white to harvest. We want to wait. He wants us to work. We want to sit around and do nothing. He wants us to get busy so he can come back. Most Christians are not Millerite in theology. They wouldn't want to set a date, but there's certainly Millerites in practice. They just sit around waiting for his return and aren't busy doing what the Lord wants them to do. I mean, you say the Millerites were crazy. My goodness, you're just doing the same thing. You just got a different act. If you're not involved in the mission Christ wants, that's what you are, theology. So Christ has left us responsible to spread the gospel. And since the gospel spread is the kingpin that determines the Lord's return, we can hasten his coming. And folks, I'm going to say this, and I want you to grab, grab this with me. There is, there is coming a day, there is coming a day when the father is going to turn to his son and say, Go get your children. 
Jesus may ask the question today to his father, is it time? And the father says, not yet. Not yet. But there will come a day. There will come a day when the father says to his son, go get your children. And for that day, we work now. That's the issue. You can talk about the rapture all you want, but even if you get the calendar right, it doesn't change what your responsibility is today. And so I give you this invitation. Two clear points. One, are you more concerned about when he's coming back than about the work he has for you to do right here, right now? If you've got someone that you love that doesn't know the Lord, put up your hand right now because I want to pray for you. Wow. Father God, I just come to you on behalf of the people that the people here love. And Lord, we confess to you we don't want to go to heaven without them. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be faithful in that part of the world that you want reached before you return. Bless them and bring them into the kingdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And I would say one other thing is that the only way to be ready for his return is to be ready for your demise. Let me explain that. Let's say Christ doesn't come back for 150 years. You don't have 150 years to make up your mind whether you'll be a Christian or not. You got today. You got today. I don't know if you'll have tomorrow, but I knew you, know you got today. Because the Bible says that today if you hear his heart, his voice, don't harden your heart. And if you don't know the Lord, if you don't have a relationship with God, and you know that if you were to die tonight, you wouldn't go to heaven, today's a day you can know the Lord. The, the praise team is going to sing. And... Uh, as they sing, we've got some of our elders here. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, and you would like to accept him as your Lord and Savior, if you'll acknowledge the fact that you're separated from him, believe in him as the only source for salvation for your life and commit your life to him, you can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're going to go to heaven. And as we stand and sing our closing song, what I want you to do is I want you to come forward and Margaret will be here and our elders will be here and they would just be glad to pray with you. If you've got someone that's really burdened, your heart's really burdened for right now and you want someone to agree with you on, in prayer, you come up. These folks will pray with you and be glad to do it. Folks, I got my theology messed with because the truth of the matter is I came to the point that I figured out this week that even if I get all the points of theology right, my job doesn't change. And if I've got all the points in the theology wrong, my job doesn't change. And we get so concerned about all the wrong stuff, folks. I don't care if you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. I could care less. I'm a pan-millennialist. I just believe it'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> but I believe I know what I have to do now. And that's why the scriptures say, if you know these things, what manner of people ought you to be? So if you don't know the Lord, why don't you come, let these folks pray, pray with you.